Thank you. You made me a bit embarrassed there. <laughs> uh, I assure you, I'm not here to brag about Sweden, although I'm very proud Swede. But I'm here to sort of give you a view of uh, what, ha what is happening in this environment in Sweden, and maybe then give you a sort of uh, a peek into what could be done, if not already done, here in the countries where you reside, in Lithuania and elsewhere. So, uh, I will of course start off as my esteemed colleague from the Central Bank of Lithuania with a disclaimer. In my presentation I will speak about my views, my opinions, the statistics I have uh, showing you. You will see the source from where it's picked up. But this is not necessarily the view of Swedbank. So any questions you will have coming going further on this subject and on my presentation, you will be warmly welcome to contact me. Okay? Thank you. So, maybe this is the scope. Uh, I will give you a presentation on what's happening in the payment market, in a market that is highly digitalized and where digital access is sort of the new normal. And, uh, what has then changed our environment. We've referred a bit about uh, regulation that has been coming and going. There has been a lot of regulation. Sometimes we refer to it as, as, as the regulatory tsunami. I must also admit that this regulation is actually paving the way for the future. If we look at the original, for those of you, most of you in this room are not old enough to be around when the Lisbon agenda was presented, but in that we have four freedoms, free movement of uh, capital, goods, services, and persons. In 2010, that was going to be realized. It wasn't really realized as we saw on pictures previously shown. People are not that frequently moving, and we do not buy goods everywhere. Uh, we are very local. What we now see is the initiative of digital agenda. Oh, I think PSD2 shows the, uh, the willingness from the regulator to uh, sort of ensure that there is stability in the digital arena and that there is enough player to, for, to create competition and innovation in the digital arena. And that's the difference between the Lisbon agenda, the possibility to realize that has come with the technical developments. Today, I still buy locally. I, I sit in my coach in my living room, and I buy online. And I buy on a website that is written in Swedish because of my preferred language. But the supplier is not Swedish. They only have a website. And I don't really care where I'm buying from. I want the safety of saying, I understand what they say. I look at the goods, and I buy. But now I'm really going, I'm really moving. And the capital and the goods and the services are moving without I having to move at all. And that's the difference. So with that said, uh, I will then uh, give you a presentation on the Swedish payment market now before the PSD2 being implemented. And also give you some insight on what I think PSD2 will contribute to. That is not maybe the sexiest part because that's sort of opportunity. It's an obligations and responsibility. But the third part, I think, is more in, maybe more interesting to you, and that's what's in it for the customer. And this is both consumer and corporate, because the directive is not a consumer directive. What applies for the a payment account is equally applying for a corporate payment account and a consumer payment account. And then I will talk a bit about what are the challenges. So, this is Sweden. We are really increasingly going digital. You can see that in the last 10 years, there's been a tremendous change. Uh, we, a Swedish citizen, an adult that's between 18 and 75, has internet access. 93% of the population has internet access. And also access to a computer and broadband. So this creates a digital environment that is really exciting for innovation to take place in. Also, we have smartphones, 81% are using our smartphone as a digital window to whatever we want to do. That's the access. The own device are slightly lower because we have a good uh, relationship to our employers. In, in Sweden. So the device I use is the device I either bring to the company or can bring home from the company. 
I have one smartphone that I use. It's provided by Swedbank, but I can also use it at home. So therefore, it gives a wider access, and that is really uh, extremely important. And if you see the age group, you see a downturn, of course, with 76 plus. But this is evening out as we go along, because those who are in the 46 to 55 are going to be in the 70s very fairly shortly. We also see how we do bank services. And since, of course, we do other services digital, but this is a focus on banks. We do have access to an internet bank and a mobile bank. It's gone from 2007, it was 80% and now it's up to 94% that has digital access to, uh, to our banks. And what we can see is there is a shift now from the internet bank to the mobile bank. It's easy to use, it's, it's always with you, and you use it much more often, more often than you do the internet bank. We also see that payment initiation through the digital device has increased. It's up to 88% of all the payments. And this is the account to account payments. And predominantly it's payments of bills we do in, in, the, in the mobile environment. I would say that that is slightly shifting now. I will talk about Swish a bit later and then I will, you, I will explain to you how we have evolved based on Swish. And account information. You normally use your, for the everyday looking at your account, maybe balance checking, it is the mobile bank. When you do maybe your <laughs> more in-depth calculation of your economy, then you, you normally do it back home on your lappy and with the internet bank. So what we also see then is the payment pattern and cash use. We, Sweden is an extreme card-oriented uh, country. In the, uh, in the uh, so retail environment, uh, we all, uh, almost 85% of all the purchases is done with a card. So in the physical environment, we are extremely card-oriented. And also the same if we look at then the e-commerce, but we will also, it's also more possible than to introduce new payment instruments into the e-commerce environment. Here we see Swish. Swish is really taking on, and today we have 4.8 million users, that consumers that are payers. And as a pay, in that environment, you can have also the P2P. I can pay you uh, money if I owe you money or if I want to give you money. Uh, we have collecting for colleagues' birthday that's done by Swish. Sharing restaurant bills is done by Swish. All my Christmas gifts were done by Swish. All my, the kids in our family only want money. They don't want <laughs> physical gifts, so Swish is a good possibility here. 85,000 of the corporates are also uh, Swish users. So there is a, a commerce area here where you can pay with Swish. Uh, so this is really increasing, and we will see that when it comes to cash usage in the society. In the 50s, 10% of the GDP was cash-based. Now, today, it's 2%. So it's decreasing on the part, share of the GDP. However, the value of the cash in the society is increasing. But that's more sort of correlating to, to the uh, value of the Swedish kroner and the economy as overall. What we also see is an increase in e-commerce, and here I think this is the digital environment. We will see that brick and mortar and, and e-commerce is sort of slowly consolidating. So the payment instrument, we now say this is e- or digital payment instruments used in the e-commerce world or digital commerce, will in sort of uh, be consolidated with the physical world. So we will see more payments instrument that goes anywhere. And if we look at uh, Sweden then, 75% of, the, of the Nordic population is actually shopping online. That's quite a high number. And it's been increasing. Uh, now maybe not in numbers shopping, but in the number of uh, shopping uh, occurrences. 
We also see in Sweden, we said 17 billion euros in 2015 was spent on online shopping in, Nord in the Nordic region. And of that, Sweden was spending 6.5 billion euros. Mm. Previously, as we were so talking about what is the local and what is cross-border, I would say that when we see the local, when we shop locally, still, this is not really local. That is a web service or a website registered in Sweden, but the goods and the service provided could be provided by anyone. So the statistic is not really showing the truth entirely. But what we also see is that the cross-border shopping is increasing tremendously since we, we see that uh, Swedes are buying in the US on a US website, on a UK website. This is where we are sort of really realizing that we are shopping in, in another country. And we can see that that is increasing enormously. And what we see, the preferred payment method is the debit and credit card, but it's balanced out with invoice. And one could argue, why go back to invoice? Invoice is paper. Are we really then digital? Well, in this case, it's actually e-invoice. So the invoice is sent electronically and then automatically paid on the due date if you have that service set up in the mobile bank. The reason for the invoice is not so much that that is uh, the best payment instrument. It is that with an invoice, you get your good and you can touch and feel before you actually pay. So if we look into the reasons why customers do pay in the way they pay, we will see that there are underlying reasons, and not only the easiness of usage. We can also see that credit cards are very often used when you buy um, airplane tickets, you, you pay for your um, holiday or so, because in the credit card, if something goes wrong, you get your money back. Unfortunately, we had a couple of years back uh, a company, a travel company, selling very, very economically sound and very good uh, holiday trips. It went bankrupt. And people paying with credit card were reimbursed, whereas people that had paid by invoice or sort of directly to the account of the company was not, because that was uh, then part of the... the uh, the failure of the company. So that's why a credit card is shown. So when we look at the underlying reasons, we can see other things than only the payment pattern of easy of use. So there are many things that we need to take into consideration. So what will then PSD2 contribute to the market? Well, the market in Sweden has already changed. PSD2 will not um, introduce third parties. It will not introduce fintechs. It will make the environment more predictable, more stable. So we will see a support for the market to create some uh, good relationships between the different players, sound rules on which we all can cooperate. I think that's really the, the, the benefit that we will have, all of us will have of the PSD2 in Sweden. Then, the demanding regulation now we have is that we have PSD2, which is actually opening up for the access to the consumer or the corporate account information. In parallel, we have what is called the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. That is actually setting requirement on how and what banks can do with the consumer data the consumer has given us because the information is given by the consumer to the bank to store. So on the one hand, we must share and shall share. On the other hand, we have requirements. So we are now looking at the regulators, and here in Lithuania, you need to do the same, to get a good balance between these two, because it could be, unfortunately, very contradicting. So we need the assistance so that we can still share information without running the risk as a bank of then getting fined for sharing the data. So here we need to create a balance. So I bet you really already know that. We also see that the change in the customer behavior. Customers are digital. We, we saw that earlier in the figures I said. And also customers are, they are looking for easy and instant payment. They want to do things now. 
not tomorrow, not the day after. Uh, five years ago, I was attending a conference in London, and already then we were sort of finalizing Swish. So we were real-time money look in, in Sweden. But I was talking to, to some colleagues from other countries, and they said, we don't think that consumers really are interested in getting the money uh, instantly. We think that they all only want to get to know that they're going to get the money instantly. And we had a very long discussion on that. The year after I visited the same conference, then one of these colleagues came up to me and said, I know what you're talking about now. They had gone home and done a survey locally and realized that instant was not an SMS notification saying, well, next time you visit your bank, you will have some money, or on Monday you will have money when the bank opens. It was now on Sunday, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I wanted my money because I want to spend them again. And, of course, the economy is, is benefiting if we do get access to money, it can reuse them uh, very rapidly. So we see that there is a, a shift. And also we see that when you shop online, you are not looking for the store to be open 9 to 5 or if you have the evening opening until 8. You're, you, maybe you wake up 4 o'clock in the night. You don't, can't sleep and you want to shop and then you want to pay. So it's a 24-7 environment we are living in. And that is both a challenge and an opportunity. We also then see, and here is where I think PSD2 is coming in, we see and have seen for a very long time new competitors. Now we are sort of, the, the, the fog is sh uh, lifting a bit because the PSD2 in the arena of the payment initiation area and account information area is creating sort of uh, 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 something that is tangible on the relationship we can create. We also see that, uh, and that we have seen for quite some time in Sweden, uh, payments, the basic payment is a commodity. It's almost impossible to charge for. Everyone expects to pay and be paid. So it's really, really difficult to charge for. It is the value-added services, the easiness of paying, the access to my money, the possibilities to reuse my money, the reconciliation part for the corporates, and the easiness to uh, transfer money from my account to another account. That's where we, uh, we, we are willing to pay as customers, both corporates and consumers. And, and we see also a vertical uh, integration. We see a shift in the payment value chain. I will show you a bit about the corporate later on. And we see also technology, because here I think, maybe not robotics and blockchain and internet or things, but I think these are challenges that are coming. And I think this is where we see where innovation can take us. How, and, but it has to be balanced by risk and cons consumer protection because PSD2 is all about consumer protection. And, of course, the macroeconomic that we live in, it is, of course, uh, showing us the way and allowing us to take some path. Here is an example of the fintech that we already have, and this is merely an example. Uh, we have over 70 companies, and I will show you a bit about the investment. There was um, a previous speaker talked about the need for investment, the need for capital. I will show you a bit about the fintech environment in Sweden. But here we see uh, some fintechs, and here we see Tink, as was mentioned. SEB has uh, invested in Tink, but it was a, it all, it's not SEB development. It's Tink, it's a fintech company that was growing, and the investment was done sort of as an investment. But Tink is a multi-aggregating account information service provider. We have on that hand, we have Klarna, we have iSettle, I think we have Trustly. These are payment initiation services. So they have been along, around for a very long time. With, and, and we cooperate. We cannot cooperate with all. We don't have the, the strength and the capacity to cooperate with all because administratively it's very challenging, of course. But we, we do cooperate. Uh, but we need also to, to find the common denominators and the common ground, and I think that's where PSD2 is going to take us. This is the in fintech environment in Sweden. I'm sorry for the slightly old figures. There are more... Uh, sort of recent figures, but these figures shows much better 
the environment that fintech companies are working in in Sweden. We talked about the investment earlier. If you look at Sweden, then by, between 2010 and 14, this is the million dollar, US dollar that was invested in fintechs. You see, predominantly it was in fintechs providing payment services. We also see that the cryptocurrency and wealth management. So there are variety, but there is it's a domination in the payment area. In Sweden, you might think that, well, that's not the area then that I would approach because it must be very crowded there. But also this is a, an area that, where there is a lot of expansion and a lot of possibilities. If you look at the right-hand side, this is the companies that has been invested in. And uh, this is from a study, unfortunately in Swedish, but it's very, very interesting if you want to see. No, sorry, it is in English. Sorry for that. It is in English. And it's very interesting because it describes the path that fintech environment has taken. So I strongly recommend it. And fin Stockholm then, 32% uh, of the total investment in private companies was in fintech companies. And if we look at uh, the size of the city, Stockholm is the third largest fintech city. So it's uh, extremely interesting to invest. And we have the environment that is created, I think, is also something that I can see here in Lithuania and in Latvia and Estonia, is that you have very good education. You have high education, very educated people. And that they come together and you create an environment that is very open for in more innovation and development. That's when you can sort of take the next step. Then the PSD2 more concrete. We've been touching up, up, up on this, of course. It is the regulated right, and I must stress this is a regulated right, to provide payment initiation services. That is to, from a payment account, hold by a customer, a consumer, or a corporate, create a payment initiation, a service that could be provided digitally. An account information service, the same thing. From that payment account, derived data that also can be aggregated with customers' data held in a couple of banks, if you are a multi-bank consumer or a corporate. It could also be, <clears throat> but that is not within the PSD2, but we see that in Sweden. Negotiation with petrol companies where you also provide the petrol company card in a disaggregated environment. So the law gives regulated right, but the market gets, gives you opportunities that is not restricted to the law. So when you look at it, you need to have the consumer or the corporate eye and see what else is needed. Uh, so, and, but that has to be, of course, under agreement then. Because as was pointed out before, this regulated right does not require an ag agreement between the fintech company and the account holding payment service provider. And we have this payment instrument issuing as well. It's, it says card-based, and this, this is where I must then give a stronger disclaimer, because when I read the, the directive, I see that it says card-based, but you could argue also, what is card-based? Is card the plastic? Or could card as easily be here? And then you can have to sort of investigate what is the possibility in issuing these instruments. It could be issuing a new instrument, but it could also be providing a service for a retailer that already has a card-based instrument. If you don't know if you have H&M here, of course you have, but they have a card. Uh, which is actually you can pay and you have a credit on it if you want to. You can use it in the store. Such a card could then also be easily accessed to a payment account. So we will see fintech companies, but we will also see other actors finding this interesting. So it's not an arena where fintechs and banks are going to be alone, not at all. It's, we're going to be very crowded here, I think. So, what are then the possibilities? And as I said, these are the possibilities that are not talking about possibilities for customers. It's possibilities for us. What we have is an adoption uh, for recognized messaging. Today, what we see is that the fintech companies that are operating in Sweden, those that are already established, I must say, do not see the need for what I'm now saying. But companies that are coming 
entering into to the arena. They have to, today, look at maybe 20 different banks if they want to become an account information aggregator. How, what, how do I retrieve information from that bank, that bank, that bank? And if you took, take it to a European uh, environment, we're talking about around about 5,000 banks, four or 5,000 banks, and then it becomes very complex. So here I, we see that we need to have a standardized messaging, a request for account information standardized, a response to that standardized, because that will also create, if I have a standard, I can access several or all. This is not in the regulation. There is coming up some regular technical standards from EBA. I must say, though, that they will not be as detailed so that we will have the message standard that we will have to create ourselves. Currently, there is um, this dialogue going on between banks, uh, that, which is called CUPS. And that is bank then sitting down together and say, okay, how can we standardize? We're not standardizing. We are looking at how can we standardize and how can we make this a standardized world? Because it becomes so much easier for all of us. We're also looking then at standardized APIs because today uh, there is a variety of different access points to the banks that FinTechs has to adapt to. If we have a standardized API, then uh, and I'm talking a standardized API with quality, uh, then that is easily accessed. And a FinTech can more easily broaden its service, start in a small region with a couple of bank access, and then broaden maybe to multi-countries. We also see then the requirements, and that is up to the communities. Uh, and when I'm talking about the community, I'm talking about being in the digital arena for consumer and corporates. This is what we need to do. And also, when we have the possibility, we have the possibility to take full advantage of the techni uh, technical development that allow us to do the innovation and create good consumer services. But it also requires of us, because trust is of essence. If we lose the trust of the consumer or the corporate, we will not see this take off to the extent that we would want to. So we need to be sharing the responsibility of creating an arena where there is stability, security, low risk. And the risk is taken by the party introducing the risk. So what's in it for the customer then? Here we can see what we all already see in Sweden. Uh, this is accounting aggregation from a consumer perspective. The bank has a provide a mobile bank where you can see everything. But here also, this is a picture of Tink in the middle and other service providers, which is non-banks, providing more or less the same aggregated information. Different payment devices, you see Swish. This is all banks in Sweden, so you can do it from an account to another account in another bank, and you can do it with a mobile bank. But here, so you see Klarna Pay, or you can see Trustly Payment. So this is uh, already provided by fintech companies, mainly for the e-commerce, I must say. In the physical world, we don't see it that much, apart from the acquiring part of the cards. This is the corporate uh, arena. Maybe not such a beautiful picture, but this is actually the payment value chain in the e-commerce. And there is several areas where a fintech could come in provide the services that are stipulated in the Payment Services Directive and create value for that corporate. Today, when you, use, when you are in the e-commerce arena as a retailer, you use a payment service provider, but not the payment service provider as the definition is in the Payment Service Directive, because payment service provider in the directive is credit institution, financial institution, or payment institutions. Payment service provider in the e-commerce arena is our aggregators that aggregate a variety of uh, payment instruments, also information that the retailer need to ensure easy to pay, easy to use, the checkout. So here we see that also in the cash register now when the, we, we, we're going from uh, digital channel the, and brick and mortar into an omni-channel where you do pay with the same instrument, whether you're in the physical store or in the online store. Today we see very frequently that you shop online, but when you want to return, you go to the physical store 
and give back the goods. So you pay online and want to be repaid in the physical arena. That is the reason why it has to merge. So what are the challenges then? Well, the customer understanding of when and to what they're giving the consent. Back to the trust. We need to ensure that our consumers, when using this, corporates are much easier. Uh, or at least larger corporates are more easier. But we also here talk about small companies and they are equally needing our assistance here. They need to understand what they are giving consent to. Um, today we have uh, some example. Uh, we are working with several and that's working very well. We are living up to this. Uh, so the examples I give is not so, so significant for the Swedish market, but there are warning signs that we need to take into consideration and be aware of. We are uh, facing companies there today that are providing services uh, along these lines, that it's actually copying us, our uh, internet bank logon page, with our logo. So the customer actually thinks that they are logging into the bank, whereas actually it is then the, 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 the company logging in and getting access to. That, of course, should not happen. It needs to be very fair and transparent and ask the customer, inform the customer. Here we have a joint responsibility. Also, I see that we have to, again, data usage and sharing. We need to understand that data is the, we've, a previous speaker said data is the consumer's data. Yes, but the consumer or the customer needs to understand what they're doing with the data. For example, we have credit scoring. Companies that provide a payment initiation service to our customers we found out that they were doing also credit scoring without the knowledge of the customer. And they were also selling, selling that credit scoring to other companies, which is not, that cannot happen either, unless the customer has given strong consent. So we have a responsibility here. We're looking also at the FSA, uh, financial service uh, authority or sort of regulators. We need that they have an inefficient approval process for the account servicing and the payment initiation service provider. Well, by efficient, I mean easy to apply, easy to understand what my obligation are, a process that also gives a certification and a registration and a database where we can all be, us who are then registered, we should be in that database so everyone else know who we are and what, what uh, rights we have. So what we have to then, the challenges here, again, I'm slightly running over time, I'm sorry for that, but the challenges here we have is we have to avoid that what we do now, as I said, the basic payment is very difficult to charge for. In that payment, it's also the buildup of the infrastructure. And the infrastructure is necessary, both for the account information and the payment initiation. If we don't have a solid infrastructure and an efficient infrastructure, none of us will succeed. So we have to figure out how do we encourage investment in infrastructure while at the same time sharing the revenues that that F infrastructure brings. So that is mainly my message. Thank you for listening and sorry for the overdraft of time.